Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be with you today to discuss the listing of mineral companies on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Mineral and petroleum companies may list on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange subject to the additional listing eligibility requirements, disclosure standards and continuing obligations set out in Chapter 18 of the Main Board Listing Rules or Chapter 18A of the GEM Listing Rules. In this webinar, I'll be talking about the Main Board Listing Rules as the requirements for the Main Board and GEM are broadly similar. The main difference is in respect of waivers, which I'll cover later in the webinar. Chapter 18 is a chapter specifically devoted to the listing of mineral companies. The particular advantage of listing a mineral company is the possibility of obtaining a waiver from the requirement to meet the financial tests for listing under Listing Rule 805. Usually, a listing applicant is required to satisfy one of three alternative financial tests set out in Listing Rule 805, the profit test, the market cap revenue cash flow test, or the market cap revenue test. Listing Rule 805 financial tests also include management continuity and ownership continuity and control requirements. As of August 2022, there were 67 energy companies and 127 materials companies listed on the Hong Kong Exchange's main board, with a total market cap of 1 trillion Hong Kong dollars and 511 billion Hong Kong dollars respectively. Hong Kong's main board has been a popular listing venue for Chinese mining and energy companies and has hosted the listings of some of China's largest companies in these sectors, including those of China Shenhua Energy Company, China Coal Energy Company Limited and Zhejin Mining Group. Chapter 18 of the listing rules applies to mineral companies which are defined under listing rule 1801 as falling into one of two categories. First, mineral companies are new applicants whose major activity, whether directly or through their subsidiaries, is the exploration and or extraction of natural resources, which include minerals or petroleum. A major activity is one representing 25% or more of the total assets, gross revenue or operating expenses of the applicant and its subsidiaries. Although the definition doesn't refer specifically to production activities, such as smelting, the Hong Kong Exchange has said in its FAQs that it follows the practice of other international exchanges, with the terms extraction and production being able to be used interchangeably. However, companies that are only engaged in refining activities are not considered to be mineral companies. The second category of mineral companies are existing listed issuers that complete a relevant notifiable transaction involving the acquisition of mineral or petroleum assets. A relevant notifiable transaction is a transaction that constitutes certain types of a notifiable transaction under Chapter 14 of the Listing Rules, in particular a major transaction, a very substantial disposal, that's a VSD, a very substantial acquisition, often called a VSA, an extreme transaction or a reverse takeover, an RTO. The classifications of major transaction, VSD and VSA, are based on the transaction's size relative to the issuer's size. A major transaction is 25% or more of the issuer's existing activities, while VSD and VSAs are higher transactional amounts. A series of small acquisitions completed over 12 months may be aggregated under Listing Rule 1422. In comparison, an RTO or an extreme transaction is an acquisition or a series of acquisitions of assets by a listed issuer, which individually or together with other transactions or arrangements are an attempt to have the effect of achieving a listing of the acquisition targets. Mineral companies seeking to list on the Hong Kong Exchange need to satisfy the basic and generally applicable eligibility requirements for listing set out in Chapter 8 of the Listing Rules. The additional eligibility criteria for mineral companies are set out in Chapter 18. First, a new applicant mineral company is required by Listing Rule 18032 to have at least a portfolio of indicated resources in the case of minerals or contingent resources in the case of petroleum that are identifiable under one of the accepted reporting standards and substantiated in a competent persons report. A competent persons report is a public report prepared by an independent expert referred to as a competent person on resources and or reserves in compliance with chapter 18. I'll cover the requirements relating to competent persons reports and competent persons, as well as the accepted reporting standards later. Indicated resources are mineral resources for which the tonnage, density, shape, physical characteristics, grade and mineral content 
can be estimated with a reasonable level of confidence. Contingent resources refer to quantities of petroleum which are estimated to be potentially recoverable from known accumulations by applying development projects, but are not currently considered to be commercially recoverable because of one or more contingencies. The portfolio of resources indicated or contingent must also be meaningful and of sufficient substance to justify a listing. These requirements mean that early stage or pure play exploration companies are not eligible for listing under Chapter 18. Rights of active participation. Under Listing Rule 18031, a new applicant mineral company must establish that it has the right to actively participate in the exploration for and or extraction of resources through either one of two ways. Firstly, through control over a majority by value of the assets in which it has invested together with adequate rights over the exploration for and or extraction of resources. This will normally be interpreted as an interest of more than 50% by value in its total assets. Secondly, through adequate rights arising under arrangements acceptable to the Hong Kong Exchange, which give the company sufficient influence in decisions over the exploration for and or extraction of the resources. According to the exchange's guidance letter GL5213, adequate rights may be demonstrated through joint ventures, product profit sharing arrangements, or other valid arrangements which give sufficient influence, which the Hong Kong Exchange ordinarily expects to be at least a 30% interest, corresponding with the level of controlling interest under the listing rules. Other arrangements where an applicant has an interest below 30% but actively operates mining projects may be considered by the Hong Kong Exchange, depending on the facts and circumstances of the particular case. Examples of such other arrangements which may demonstrate adequate rights giving the applicant sufficient influence include exploration and or extraction rights granted under specific government mandates or the ability of an applicant to veto resolutions. The Hong Kong Exchange said in its 2010 consultation conclusions on new listing rules for mineral companies that it would adopt a purposive approach in determining what is appropriate in specific circumstances and place the onus on applicants to demonstrate the adequacy of their rights and sufficiency of influence. Working capital requirements. Listing Rule 18034 requires a new applicant mineral company to demonstrate that it has sufficient working capital for 125% of the group's requirements for the next 12 months, including general administrative and operating costs, property holding costs, and the cost of any proposed exploration and or development, which are costs relating to the applicant's daily operation, for example, contracting fees for excavating minerals and transport fees for delivering minerals. Capital expenditures, such as expenditures relating to the development of mine infrastructure or expansion of processing facilities, are not required to be included in the working capital requirement, but applicants have normally included such expenditures as a matter of prudence. However, where capital expenditures are financed out of borrowings, relevant interest and loan repayments are required to be included in the calculation. A statement as to the sufficiency of working capital must be included in the listing document. A new applicant mineral company that can't satisfy the profit test, the market cap revenue cash flow test or the market cap revenue test of Listing Rule 805 may be accepted for listing under Listing Rule 1804. The exchange says in its guidance letter GL5213 that Listing Rule 1804 exempts an applicant from complying with the three financial tests under Listing Rule 805, which also include the management continuity and ownership continuity and control requirements. In order to be eligible for a waiver under Listing Rule 1804, a listing applicant must establish that it fulfills conditions relating to the path to commercial production, directors and management experience, and primary activity. So what is the path to commercial production? The exchange said in its 2010 consultation conclusions on new listing rules for mineral companies that a mineral company seeking a waiver from the financial eligibility tests of Listing Rule 805 must be able to demonstrate a clear path to com commercial production to qualify for the waiver. This was not codified in the listing rules. However, the exchange acknowledged in its guidance letter GL5213 that it has been applying the rule in practice. 
GL5213 says that in order to demonstrate a clear path to commercial production, the applicant must satisfy certain conditions. First, they must have carried out exploration and or development activities on some or all of their mining assets during part or all of the track record period. These assets are defined as pre-production mining assets. If all a company's mining assets were under production throughout the track record period, this condition would not be satisfied. Secondly, the pre-production mining assets must consist of a meaningful portfolio in terms of both quality and quantity of the applicant's resources and reserves. The third and final condition is that the applicant is required to present a detailed plan with reasonable assumptions to achieve profitable commercial production in relation to the pre-production mining assets. In GL 5213, the exchange sets out the factors that it will consider in assessing the feasibility of the plan. The factors include the life of the mine with the pre-production mining assets and the project payback period the development or production stage of the pre-production mining assets, the competent person's opinion on the adequacy and reasonableness of the applicant's mine plan, production schedule and or pre-feasibility study, the commodity price and demand for the applicant's products, an estimate of cash operating costs and the cost of proposed exploration and or development. The feasibility of future non-IPO fundraising needed to bring the project to production and the level of certainty as to whether the required mining permits and licenses will be obtained. The listing document must include details of the plan in order to provide investors with adequate information to enable them to conduct an informed assessment on its value. Listing Rule 1804 explicitly requires that the listing applicants, directors and senior management taken together have sufficient experience relevant to the exploration and or extraction activity that the mineral company is undertaking. The individuals relied on must have at least five years of relevant industry experience and details of that experience must be included in the listing document. According to GL 5213, where the directors or managers experience in commodities or minerals is different from the applicant's operations, the exchange will consider whether their skills are transferable to the applicant's mining activities and will take into account their academic and professional qualifications, any significant mining related achievements or awards and their contribution to the mining industry and or any mineral companies. As set out in a note to listing rule 1804, a waiver will only be available to listing applicants whose primary activity is the exploration for and or extraction of resources. This does not have to be its sole activity, but it should be its main focus. As I mentioned at the beginning, Chapter 18A of the GEM listing rules covers the listing of mineral companies on GEM, and the main difference with Chapter 18 of the main board listing rules is in respect of waivers. Instead of being able to obtain a waiver under main board listing rule 1804 of the requirement to satisfy the main board financial tests for listing, GEM mineral company applicants can obtain a waiver under GEM listing rule 18A04 only from the two financial years track record requirement under GEM listing rule 1112A and the requirement for the accountant's report to cover two financial years. A note to GEM listing rule 18A04 says that where the exchange accepts a trading record of less than two financial years, the applicant is still required to satisfy the minimum 30 million Hong Kong dollar cash flow requirement for the shorter trading record period. In addition to the listing document disclosure requirements that generally apply to issuers, mineral companies must satisfy additional listing document disclosure requirements. Listing Rule 18051 requires a new applicant mineral company to include in its listing document a report on its resources and reserves prepared by the competent person, a competent person's report. I'll discuss the requirements for competent person's reports a bit later. The listing rules set out additional disclosure requirements specific to pre-production stage mineral companies and production stage mineral companies. Under listing rule 1807, a listing applicant that has not yet commenced production is required to disclose in its listing document its plans to proceed to production with indicative dates and costs. These plans must be supported by at least a scoping study, which is defined in Listing Rule 1801 as a preliminary evaluation of a mineral project, including an assessment of the economic viability of mineral resources, and which should include forecast production schedules and cost estimates based on data 
under which the resources are identified. If a project survives a scoping study, it provides an indication that it is appropriate to proceed with further work and commission a pre-feasibility study. Accordingly, scoping studies are only required for mining companies which have not yet commenced production. Listing Rule 1807 requires the scoping study to be substantiated by the opinion of a competent person. It may, but is not required to, form part of the competent person's report. Where the exploration or extraction rights have not yet been obtained, there must be prominent disclosure in the listing document of any risks relevant to obtaining these rights. A mineral company involved in the exploration for or extraction of resources is required by Listing Rule 1808 to disclose prominently that its resources may not ultimately be extracted at a profit. In respect of production stage companies, Listing Rule 1806 requires mineral companies that have commenced production to disclose an estimate of the operating cash cost per appropriate unit for the minerals and or pet petroleum produced. Under Listing Rule 18033, applicants must set out the components of specified cash operating costs separately by category, including workforce employment, consumables, fuel, electricity, water and other services, on and off-site admin, environmental protection and monitoring, transportation of workforce, product marketing and transport, non-income taxes, royalties and other governmental charges, and contingency allowances. Applicants are also required to explain the reason for any departure from the list of items to be included under cash operating costs and discuss any material cost items that should be highlighted to investors. Material cost items include items such as favourable tax treatment for a limited time or that may be subject to challenge or a temporary disruption to transportation routes which resulted in increased costs for a limited time. Listing Rule 1805 sets out other matters which are required to be disclosed in the listing document of a mineral company, irrespective as to whether it is pre-production or has commenced production. The listing document must include the nature and extent of the company's prospecting, exploration, exploitation, land use and mining rights, and a description of the properties to which those rights attach. This includes the duration and other key terms and conditions of the concessions as well as any licenses and consents required. The applicant must also disclose details of material rights to be obtained. The listing document must include a statement of any legal claims or proceedings that may influence the company's rights to explore or mine. Further, specific and general risks should be disclosed, having regard to Guidance Note 7 of the listing rules, suggested risk assessment for mineral companies. According to GL 5213, Mineral companies should follow Guidance Note 7 on risks disclosure to the extent applicable or ensure the risks disclosed in the listing document are no less than those set out in the Guidance Note. The Guidance Letter further provides that all material risks mentioned in the Competent Persons Report should be disclosed in the Risk Factors section of the listing document. Listing Rule 1805 also specifies matters that must be disclosed if relevant and material to the mineral company's business operations. This includes project risks arising from environmental, social and health and safety issues, the impact of any non-government organisation on the sustainability of mineral and or exploration projects, as well as environmental liabilities of the company's projects or properties. This also includes disclosure of sufficient funding plans for remediation, rehabilitation and closure and removal of facilities in a sustainable manner. If relevant and material, applicants must disclose their compliance with host country laws, regulations and permits, their historical experience of dealing with host country laws and practices, including management of differences between national and local practice, and payments made to host country governments in relation to tax, royalties and other significant payments on a country-by-country -country basis. Further, applicants are required to disclose, if relevant and material, their historical experience of dealing with the concerns of local governments and communities on the sites of their mines, exploration properties and relevant management arrangements, as well as any claims that may exist over the land on which exploration or mining activity is being carried out, including any ancestral or native claims. The Hong Kong Exchange in GL 5213 sets out additional expectations for mineral companies' listing document disclosure, covering the summary, 
business and financial information sections, the competent persons report and related disclosures and general drafting guidelines. For example, in the financial information section, the guidance letter provides that the Hong Kong Exchange expects disclosure of a sensitivity analysis on the impact of changes in the price of mineral or petroleum assets, contracting fees, utility expenses and or transportation costs, if material, on the applicant's financial results for the track record period and the forecast period. There should be disclosure of the exploration expenses during the track record period and up to the latest practicable date and how they were accounted. The exchange also expects disclosure of the expected time when a project under development will become self-sufficient in terms of working capital and funding, as well as the additional funding amount needed to attain such level of self-sufficiency. In respect of the Competent Persons Report, GL 5213 provides, amongst other things, that if the competent person has a different view on certain assumptions made by the applicant, such as the processing recovery rate, the listing document should disclose both views, highlight the differences between the views, disclose the underlying reasons for the different views, and, if the more conservative view is adopted, the impact on the applicant. The guidance letter provides that if the competent person did not carry out a site visit, the applicant should disclose in the business section the basis on which the reserves or resources, cost forecasts and other data concerning the mines or oil fields as stated in the competent persons report are arrived at, how the lack of a site visit would impact the reliability of the information and a relevant risk factor. The sponsor should submit to the exchange the basis that the competent person considers unnecessary to conduct verification work by carrying out any facility or on-site investigation. GL 5213 also sets out detailed disclosure guidance for the business section, covering project development, workflow and production, outsourcing arrangements, utilities, sales and product delivery, and regulatory environmental and social matters. For example, the business section should include a summary of all outstanding approvals and the current status of the relevant applications, as well as any restriction on the renewal of exploration and mining permits. It should also include the legal advisor's view with basis on the mineral company's ability to obtain and or renew all relevant licenses, permits and approvals for its proposed exploration and mining activities. The guidance letter also provides that the term mine should not be used in the listing document to describe a project which is at an early stage of development or exploration. The listing document should observe the reporting standards and requirements specific to Chapter 18 companies, which I'll talk about a bit later. Descriptions of reserves and resources in the listing document have to correspond to the specific categories in the accepted reporting standards. The directors should ensure there's no mismatch between statements about reserves and resources in the listing document and in the competent persons report. I'll now talk about competent persons reports and valuation reports. So a competent persons report is a public report prepared by a competent person on resources and or reserves under Chapter 18 of the listing rules. A competent persons report is required in three circumstances under Chapter 18. First, for a new applicant mineral company. Secondly, for mineral companies proposing to acquire or dispose of assets which are solely or mainly mineral or petroleum assets as part of a relevant notifiable transaction. Thirdly, for listed issuers that are not mineral companies proposing to acquire assets which are solely or mainly mineral or petroleum assets as part of a relevant notifiable transaction. The Hong Kong Exchange sets out in GL 5213 that although not required under the listing rules, mineral companies' internal experts who are likely to be qualified geologists and competent persons may prepare estimates of reserves at other times. For example, updates on reserves and resources in annual reports. Updates on exploration, mining production and development activities in interim and annual reports may also include statements of reserves and resources. Competent persons reports must be prepared in accordance with recognised reporting standards that are acceptable to the Hong Kong Exchange. I previously mentioned that a Chapter 18 listing applicant is required by Listing Rule 18032 to establish that it has at least a portfolio of indicated resources or contingent resources, which must be substantiated in the competent persons report. 
The Hong Kong Exchange provides additional guidance in GL 5213 on this disclosure requirement. Given the considerable burden and impracticality of requiring an applicant to include in its listing document a competent persons report for each and every resource, regardless of its size or development stage or ownership status, the Hong Kong Exchange says in guidance letter GL 5213 that it has previously granted waivers permitting applicants to exclude part of their mining assets from the competent persons report. These are called excluded projects. These waivers were granted where first the excluded projects were not material to the applicant's mineral or petroleum resource portfolio, secondly where the applicants had demonstrated that the necessary information for the preparation of a competent person's report was not available, for example the mine was at an early exploration stage or the applicant did not have the necessary information on the relevant entities or businesses which it planned to acquire or had an option to acquire. Where the relevant information for preparing a competent person's report is available, it has to be included in the report. In such a case, a waiver will only be granted from the requirement to include a competent person's report under special circumstances. For example, the exchange granted a waiver to an applicant to exclude a mine from its competent person's report as the applicant had no intention or plan to develop that mine given its insignificant size and lack of commercial value. Where the exchange has granted waivers from disclosing excluded projects in competent persons reports, applicants are subject to additional disclosure requirements. These include disclosure of relevant material information in the listing document, including the proposed terms of acquisition, expected mineral quality, proposed purchase, consideration and expected development costs, to enable investors to assess the potential of the excluded projects and the likely benefit of the acquisitions. Where application, applicants have been granted waivers, they're required to provide updates in their annual reports on the stage of development of the excluded projects and the management's intentions in relation to them. The purpose of the annual update is to allow investors to understand the progress of acquisition or the development of the part of the portfolio or resources that have not previously been reported on by a competent person. Mineral companies are also required to prepare and publish a competent persons report in accordance with the requirements in Chapter 18 and Appendix 25 to the listing rules when the relevant information becomes available, such as when the excluded projects are further developed or the mineral company acquires the entities or businesses. Appendix 25 to the listing rules sets out the information that must be included in a competent persons report for mineral companies involved in the exploration for and or extraction of petroleum resources and reserves. In relation to, to the competent person, he or she is required by listing rule 1821 to have a minimum of five years relevant experience and be professionally qualified and a member of a relevant recognized professional organization in a jurisdiction whose statutory securities regulator has satisfactory arrangements with the SFC for mutual assistance and exchange of information for enforcing and securing compliance with the laws and regulations of that jurisdiction and Hong Kong. This may be by way of the IOSCO Multilateral Memorandum of Understanding or other bilateral agreement acceptable to the exchange. A recognized professional organization means a self-regulatory organization of professional individuals in the mining or petroleum industry, which admits individuals based on their academic qualifications and experience requires compliance with professional standards of competence and ethics established by the organization and has disciplinary powers, including the power to suspend or expel a member. Under listing rule 1821, the competent person must take overall responsibility for the competent person's report. Further, the competent person must be independent of the listing applicant, its directors, senior management and advisors. The independence test is set out in Listing Rule 1822 and specifies that the competent person must have no economic or beneficial interest present or contingent in any of the assets being reported on and not be remunerated with a fee dependent on the findings of the report. In the case of an individual to be independent, he or she must not be an officer, employee or proposed officer of the issuer or any group holding or associated company of the issuer. In the case of a firm, it must not be a group holding or associated company of the issuer. None of the firm's partners or officers may be officers or proposed officers of any group 
holding or associated company of the issuer. In respect of valuation reports, the listing rules don't require a valuation report to be provided at the IPO stage. However, as I'll talk about later, valuation reports must be included in a circular to shareholders where a relevant notifiable transaction involves the acquisition of assets which are solely or mainly mineral or petroleum assets. A valuation report must be prepared by a competent evaluator. In addition to meeting the requirements for a competent person, a competent evaluator is required under Listing Rule 1823 to hold all necessary licenses and have additional experience, in particular at least 10 years relevant and recent mining or petroleum experience and at least five years relevant and recent experience in the assessment and or valuation of mineral or petroleum assets or securities. A competent persons report or valuation report may be prepared by the same competent person if he or she is also a competent evaluator. Valuations must be prepared in accordance with one of three codes, the Canadian Simbal Code, the South African Sambal Code or the Australasian Valmin Code. A mineral company must ensure that the competent evaluator states clearly the basis of valuation, relevant assumptions and the reason why a certain method of valuation is regarded as the most appropriate, taking into account the nature of the valuation and the development status of the mineral or petroleum asset. If more than one valuation method is used and different valuations result, the mineral company must ensure that the competent evaluator comments on how the valuations compare and on the reason for choosing the value adopted. Listing Rule 1824-1 provides that a competent person's report or valuation report must be addressed to the mineral company or the listed issuer. Listing Rule 1824-2 requires a competent person's report or valuation report to have an effective date less than six months prior to the date of the listing document or circular for a relevant notifiable transaction. The Hong Kong Exchange clarifies in GL 5213 that the effective date is the date of appraisal, that is the date when resources or reserves are estimated or valued and not the date of signing. Under listing rule 18052, an applicant's listing document must include a statement that no material changes have occurred since the date of the competent person's report if there are material changes, these must be prominently disclosed. According to Listing Rule 1825, a competent person's report or valuation report may include disclaimers of sections or topics outside their scope of expertise in which the competent person or competent evaluator relied upon other experts' opinions. Disclaimers cannot, however, apply to the report in its entirety. Listing Rule 1826 stipulates that reports must prominently disclose the nature and details of all indemnities provided by the issuer, indemnities for reliance placed on information provided by the issuer and third-party experts are generally acceptable, while indemnities for fraud and gross negligence are generally unacceptable. As stated in Listing Rule 1813, prior written consent must be obtained from the competent person or evaluator before an issuer may include their reports in the listing document or circular for a relevant notifiable transaction. This is regardless of whether the person or firm is retained by the listing applicant or issuer. Listing Rule 1827 imposes an obligation on any sponsor appointed to a new applicant mineral company to ensure that the competent person or competent evaluator satisfies the requirements of Chapter 18. Listing Rule 1812 provides for the exchange to dispense with the requirement to prepare a new competent persons or valuation report for a listing document or circular where the issuer has a competent persons or valuation report or equivalent that is not more than six months old and complies with Listing Rules 1818 to 1834. The issuer must provide this document and a no material change statement in the listing document or circular. Further, as set out in a note to Listing Rule 18092, as the exchange may dispense with the competent person's report requirement for relevant notifiable transactions where the relevant resources and or reserves are being disposed of rather than acquired and the shareholders have sufficient information on the assets being disposed of. 
An example of sufficient alternative information is where the mineral or petroleum assets have been reported on by a previous competent person's report and were accounted for in the issuer's balance sheet. I'll now talk about disclosure standards. Chapter 18 of the listing rule sets out the disclosure standards applicable to mineral companies, both new applicants and listed issuers. Listing rule 1829 says that information disclosed by a mineral company on mineral resources, reserves and or exploration results, including a competent person's report, must be prepared in accordance with Australasian JORC code, the Canadian National Instrument 43101 or the South African SEMREC code. Alternatively, information on mineral resources, reserves and or exploration results may be disclosed under other codes acceptable to the exchange as communicated to the market from time to time, provided that the exchange is satisfied that they offer a comparable standard of disclosure and adequate assessment of the underlying assets. According to a note to Listing Rule 1829, the exchange may allow presentation of reserves under other reporting standards if reconciliation to a reporting standard is provided and a reporting standard applied to specific assets is used consistently. Listing Rule 1832 requires information disclosed by a mineral company on petroleum resources and reserves, including a competent persons report, to be prepared in accordance with the Petroleum Resources Management System, the PRMS, published by a group of bodies, including the World Petroleum Council. Alternatively, under Listing Rule 1832, the information may be disclosed in accordance with another code, which the Hong Kong Exchange considers to provide a comparable standard of disclosure and sufficient assessment of the underlying assets. According to GL 5213, in determining whether an alternative code will satisfy the exchange's standards, it will consider whether the code is well recognised internationally and comparable to the requirements of Chapter 18 of the Listing Rules, as well as why the applicant is adopting the code instead of the PRMS. For example, the company is listed overseas or operates in a jurisdiction where the alternative reporting standard is a filing obligation. An accepted reporting standard applied to specific assets must be used consistently. Listing Rule 1818 says that data or resources and or reserves presented in certain documents, including a listing document, a competent persons or valuation report or an annual report, must be presented in tables in a manner readily understandable to a non-technical person. This should be, there should be clear disclosure of all assumptions and statements should include an estimate of volume, tonnage and grades. Under Listing Rule 1824, a competent person's or valuation report must comply with an accepted reporting standard, disclose what reporting standard has been used in preparing the report, and explain any departure from the relevant reporting standard. An accepted reporting standard is a recognised standard acceptable to the Hong Kong Exchange, including, in respect of mineral resources and reserves, the Australasian JORC Code, the Canadian National Instrument 43101, or the South African SAMREC code, in respect of petroleum resources and reserves, the PRMS, and in respect of valuations, the Australasian Valman code, Canadian Simval code, or the South African SAMVAL code. Listing Rule 1819 provides that all statements referring to resources and or reserves must, in the case of a statement in a listing document or circular relating to a relevant notifiable transaction, be substantiated in the competent person's report. In all other cases, for example, updates in annual reports, statements referring to resources and or reserves must be substantiated by the company's internal experts. Listing Rule 1830 sets out various requirements relating to the disclosure of mineral resources and reserves. It requires mineral reserve estimates to be supported at least by a pre-feasibility study and estimates of mineral resources and reserves to be disclosed separately. A pre-feasibility study is a comprehensive study of the viability of a mineral project that has advanced to a stage where the mining method for underground mining or the pit configuration for an open pit has been established and an effective method of mineral processing has been determined. It includes a financial analysis based on realistically assumed or reasonable assumptions of technical engineering, legal operating, economic, social and environmental factors and the evaluation of other relevant factors which are sufficient for a competent person acting reasonably to determine if all or part of the mineral resource may be classified as a mineral reserve. 
as also set out in Listing Rule 1830, indicated and measured resources may only be included in economic analyses, provided that certain conditions are satisfied. Measured resources are that part of a mineral resource for which tonnage, density, shape, physical characteristics, grade and mineral content can be estimated with a high level of confidence. Indicated resources, as I previously mentioned, are estimated with a reasonable level of confidence. Indicated and measured resources may be included in economic analyses only if the basis on which they're considered to be economically extractable is explained and they are appropriately discounted for the probabilities of their conversion to reserves. All assumptions must be clearly disclosed. Listing Rule 1830 also provides that there must be a clear explanation of the methods used to determine the commodity prices used in pre-feasibility studies, feasibility studies and valuations of indicated resources, measured resources and reserves, as well as all material assumptions made and the basis on which these prices represent reasonable views of future prices. If a contract for future prices of mineral reserves exists, the contract price must be used. In respect of forecast valuations or of reserves and profit forecasts, sensitivity analyses to higher and lower prices should be supplied and all assumptions are required to be clearly disclosed. Listing Rule 1833 sets out additional disclosure requirements for mineral companies exploring for and or extracting petroleum resources and reserves. The rule firstly provides that if estimates of reserves are disclosed, the method and reason for choice of estimation must be stated. Estimations may be made under either the deterministic or prob probabilistic method as defined in the PRMS. Competent persons and issuers may decide whether to estimate reserves under either method, and there should be disclosure of the rationale. Where the probabilistic method is employed, there must be disclosure of the underlying confidence levels applied. If the net present values attributable to proved reserves and proved plus probable reserves are disclosed, they're subject to additional disclosure requirements. Proved reserves in relation to petroleum is defined as those quantities of petroleum which, by analysis of geoscience and engineering data, can be estimated with reasonable certainty to be commercially recoverable from a given date forward, from known reservoirs and under defined economic conditions, operating methods and government regulations. Probable reserves are those quantities of petroleum which analysis of geoscience and engineering data show are less likely to be recovered than proved reserves, but more certain to be recovered than possible reserves. The NPVs attributable to proved reserves and proved plus probable reserves must be presented on a post-tax basis and either at a fixed discount rate of 10% or at varying discount rates, including a reflection of the weighted average cost of capital or minimum acceptable rate of return that applies to the entity at the time of evaluation. The Hong Kong Exchange sets out in GL 5213 the circumstances in which it will allow presentation of NPVs on a pre-tax basis, in addition to the post-tax presentation, namely if such disclosure is required or allowed under a widely adopted reporting standard and is in line with disclosure made by comparable listed companies. Listing Rule 1833 also provides that proved reserves and proved plus probable reserves must be analysed separately and the principal assumptions, including prices, costs, exchange rates and effective date and the basis of the methodology, should be clearly disclosed. In the NPVs attributable to reserves, if the NPVs attributable to reserves are disclosed, they have to be presented using either a forecast price or a constant price as a base case. Constant price means the unweighted arithmetic average of the closing price on the first day of each month, within the 12 months before the end of the reporting period, unless prices are defined by contractual arrangements. There must be disclosure of the bases for the forecast case and the basis on which the forecast price is considered reasonable. Applicants are also required to present sensitivity analyses to higher and lower prices for forecast valuations of reserves. In the forecast case under the PRMS, the economic evaluation underlying the investment decision is based on the entity's reasonable forecast of future conditions, including costs and prices which will exist during the life of the project. 
Listing Rule 1833 further says that if estimated volumes of contingent resources or prospective resources are disclosed, relevant risk factors also have to be stated. Prospective resources are quantities of petroleum estimated as of a given date to be potentially recoverable from undiscovered accumulations. Under the PRMS, whether the volume of a contingent res resource is stated, risk is expressed as the chance that the accumulation will be commercially developed and graduate to the reserves class. Wherever the volume of a prospective resource is stated, risk is expressed as the chance that a potential accumulation will result in a significant discovery of petroleum. Listing Rule 1833 also says that where an estimate of future net revenue is disclosed, whether calculated without discount or using a discount rate, there must be prominent disclosure that the estimated values do not represent fair market value. Economic values must not be attached to possible reserves, contingent reserves or prospective resources. The reason for this requirement is that the measurement of such values normally lacks a widely accepted industry standard and is estimated with a high level of uncertainty. However, the Hong Kong Exchange has previously granted a waiver from this requirement in a case discussed in GL 5213. In that case, the applicant's petroleum resources, which were oil sand, were in Canada and subject to Canadian National Instrument NI 151101. This instrument allows disclosure of estimates of both the volumes and values of all reserves and resources, including possible reserves, contingent resources and prospective resources. The applicant's disclosure was in line with disclosures made by comparable companies listed in Canada. In addition, the existence of the applicant's petroleum resources was more certain than typical petroleum resources such as oil. This was primarily due to the abundant amount of oil sand in the location where the applicant op operated, and the recoverability was mostly within the applicant's control because it was primarily dependent on the appl applicant's commitment to development. In addition to the disclosure and other continuing obligations applicable to all listed companies, listed mineral companies are subject to additional ongoing disclosure requirements in Chapter 18 of the Listing Rules. Mineral companies are required by Listing Rule 1814 to disclose in their half-yearly and annual reports details of their exploration, development and mining production activities, as well as a summary of expenditure incurred on these activities during the relevant period. If no exploration, development or production activity is being conducted, this must be disclosed. Under Listing Rule 1816, mineral companies must provide an annual update of their resources and or reserves in their annual reports. Updates have to be prepared in accordance with the accepted reporting standard under which they were previously disclosed. Annual updates are not required to be supported by a competent person's report and may be prepared by the company's own internal experts. Annual updates may also be achieved by way of a no material change statement, which can be prepared internally. Non-mineral company listed issuers that publicly disclose details of their resources and or reserves are also required by Listing Rule 1815 to provide annual updates of those resources and or reserves in their annual reports. These updates must be prepared in accordance with the reporting standard under which they were previously disclosed or one of the accepted reporting standards. They can also take the form of a no material change statement. In guidance letter GL4713, the Hong Kong Exchange provides additional guidance on the disclosures required in the annual and half yearly financial reports of mineral companies and other listed issuers that publicly disclose details of their resources and or reserves. Listing Rule 1809 provides that a mineral company which proposes to acquire or dispose of assets which are solely or mainly mineral or petroleum assets as part of a relevant notifiable transaction are required to comply with certain requirements. They must comply with the requirements for notifiable transactions of Chapter 14 of the Listing Rules and, if relevant, the requirements for connected transactions of Chapter 14a of the Listing Rules. They are required to deliver a competent person's report, which must form part of the circular to shareholders on the resources and or reserves being acquired or disposed of as part of the relevant transaction. As I previously mentioned, the Hong Kong Exchange may dispense with a requirement for a competent person's report or disposals where shareholders have sufficient information on the assets being disposed of. 
In the case of a relevant notifiable transaction, that is an acquisition of assets, mineral companies are also acquired, required to produce a valuation report, which has to form part of the circular to shareholders on the mineral or petroleum assets being required. They must also comply with certain disclosure requirements in relation to assets they're buying. Material liabilities that remain with the issuer on a dispo disposal also have to be discussed. The exchange provides in GL 5213 that if the acquisition target reports its reserve and resource information using a different reporting standard, for example, the Canadian National Instrument 43101, to the reporting standard the mineral company uses, for example, the Australasian JORC code, the Hong Kong exchange would accept both reporting standards, provided that the presentation of reserves and resources under the codes are very similar. For comparability, the exchange would require disclosure of a reconciliation to one of the accepted reporting standards and the issuer to highlight any material differences in these reporting standards. Under Listing Rule 1810, non-mineral company listed issuers that propose to acquire assets which are solely or mainly mineral or petroleum assets as part of a relevant notifiable transaction must also comply with the requirements that apply to mineral companies. It's important to note that Listing Rule 1810 that applies to non-mineral company listed issuers is in respect of the acquisition of assets, whilst Listing Rule 1809 that applies to mineral companies is in respect of the acquisition or the disposal of assets. On completion of a relevant notifiable transaction involving the acquisition of mineral or petroleum assets, the listed issuer will be treated as a mineral company unless the exchange decides otherwise. So that brings me to the end of the formal part of this webinar. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day.